to dielectric videos. Now in today's video, I'm going to actually structure it a little bit differently from how I have in the past. Now in past videos, you probably recall, it, I've shown you already complete projects and basically walked through how I've actually gone about working on those projects. Well, in today's video, I'm actually going to be doing the project as I, uh, as I go along and letting you come along for the ride as the viewer. Now in today's project, I'm going to be modifying this hoverboard First and foremost, to have a D-Rock voltage display mounted right around here, actually probably more reali realistically over here on the, ba uh, on the motherboard side, so that I can monitor the battery voltage in the hoverboard while I'm riding. This will give me a better idea of how long I have left on the charge and how much further I can go on a charge. In addition, in addition to that, I'm also going to be installing this 8 to 12 amp uh, buck converter, also made by D-Rock, inside the hoverboard so that I can have a 12 volt, or rather a 13.8 volt accessory plug on the side of it, where I can plug in things like small power inverters, cell phone chargers, etc. And that's going to be uh, basically turning the hoverboard into a power bank of sorts. So I'll show you how to work on, or how I'm going to go about installing these, and hopefully it will work well. I, of course, uh, have no guarantee that this is actually going to work. It's certainly possible that I'm just going to end up breaking more hardware than I actually install. But in any case, you, the viewer, will be able to come along for the ride and see what the actual tinkering process is like. Now, before I start this video, I want to preface it by saying uh, I'm not responsible if you try this for any damage to your hoverboard, to other property around, or to injury to your person. Uh, it is inherently hazardous. You're working with a battery inside that already has been recalled by the Consumer Product Safety Commission, and on top of that, you're modifying it in a way not specified by the manufacturer. So be sure to use good judgment and uh, do anything you see in this video at your own risk. So now we can proceed to the first step, which is dismantling the hoverboard and laying out the locations where I'm going to mount and attach these components as well as uh, coming up with a game plan for how I'm actually going to install the connections and wiring to make sure that these work as well as possible and to make sure that they don't discharge the battery when they're not in use. All right, so here's the plan. I've identified that the power supply to this D-Rock voltage display requires two separate rails. There's a voltage supply rail to actually power the electronics on board this can be anything from 5 to 30 volts. And then there's the sense rail, which uh, can be anything from 0 to 100 volts. Now since this is over 30 volts, this is uh, maximally a 42 volt power uh, system, I'm going to be powering this display using, a, using the 12 volt rail provided in the hoverboard to power the electronics. Now I want to have this uh, I want to have this screen only operate when the hoverboard is switched on or when the boost converter is switched on via this switch, or buck converter, I should say. So when, the, when that's the case, uh, I want to make sure that the power rail is energized, but when I don't want it to be on, the power rail is not energized. Now, it doesn't matter whether the sense rail is energized or not, because this won't draw any current off the sense rail in any condition, or at least no appreciable current. Now I've identified on this infrared sensor pad here that there are a bunch of unpopulated through-hole connections. Now if I get my multimeter out, as you can see, I have the hoverboard switched on right now. If I probe between this connection that says plus 12 volts and this other connection here, I get about 14.33 volts. And then I can also verify that this connection here is referenced to ground by testing against the voltage rail from the battery, let me go up a range, by testing the voltage rail from the battery, and you can see 39.5 volts from the battery is present at that, uh, that mark there. Now what I need to do in order to make sure that uh, this receives the correct voltage only when the board is operating, is I need to then solder the wires that are connected to it uh, once it's mounted in the top side of the board to this ground and to this positive supply, but also I need to include two diodes to make sure that I can also power the display using the output from the buck converter instead, because the buck converter is going to be independently powered from the rest of the machine. I want this to be on its own isolated supply directly from the battery so as not to overload any of the existing 
DC to DC converter uh, equipment on board the motherboard. That way it uh, doesn't affect the stability of the hoverboard during writing or anything. Now to do that, I'm going to make sure that uh, I know where I have a solid ground and a solid connection to the battery. To connect to the battery, I'm going to have, uh, I'm going to make a small incision on the uh, voltage supply rail from the battery, solder to the wire to the conductor inside, and then electrical tape over that to make sure it doesn't short out. And I'm going to mount the boost converter to the inside of this upper shell, uh, buck converter I should say, to the inside of this upper shell so that the speaker hole also serves as a cooling vent to allow some airflow to come in to the, conver uh, to the buck converter. And I'm going to use the ground from this charging port as the ground for the converter. That way I only need one large wire going to it for the positive supply from the battery and a very small wire crossing over to the diode array driving the, the display. That way the display can be activated by the operation of the buck converter. Now, I can't pirate a connection off of the positive lead to the charge port because as you can see on the board, there's a large diode isolating the positive input supply. That way the battery doesn't accidentally discharge back into the charger. Now, of course, that means you can't draw any power off that and thus I'm going to have to directly draw from the battery. So I'm going to proceed to get the remaining hardware required to install this and to install this screen on the, pot, on the top side of this hoverboard uh, chassis. And once I've gotten those parts, I'll return and continue on the video. The next thing I'm going to do is aim my pilot hole for where my conductors for the display screen are going to go uh, to penetrate through the outer part of the chassis. Now I'm going to try to hit it right around where that circular uh, mark on the metal is because it's not going to run into any uh, circuitry there or any mounting screws uh, nearby and should allow enough clearance for the conductors to pass through regardless of any motion of these uh, other cables during the movement of the board. So I'm going to get a drill. I'm going to go ahead and use a quarter inch, uh, quarter inch drill bit for this and uh, Hopefully I'll be able to drill it fairly easily. It may be difficult because of the tendency for this to move back and forth, but I think it should be doable. So I'm going to get to as close to that hole as I can there. And now I'm just going to try and drill through. I don't know how hard this metal is going to be or how sharp this bit is. Alright, so I made it on through. Now I'm quickly going to get the vacuum out and suck that stuff up because it's going to get under the board and short it out. And I don't want that to happen. It would uh, probably wreak all kinds of havoc on it. So I'll be right back. So it looks like I recovered most of the metal shavings with the vacuum. Hopefully none of those will get into the board and cause trouble. In fact, I may turn it on right now just to make sure it's going to work uh, acceptably. So I'm just going to take a piece of metal and short the two power pins. And it seems to turn on without too much complaint. There's my hole on the other side. I'll see if it rolls. Yep. Rolls and uh, nothing blows up in the process. So that's a good sign. What it means now is we can proceed to the next step where I'm going to actually uh, build a little, uh, a little mount for it by uh, melting the plastic away to make room for a little recessed uh, setting area for the display. So I want to line it up so that uh, the display letters are going to, or the numbers are going to face in the direction I'm riding. Now I prefer to ride my board with the blue lights forward. You can ride it either way, by the way, but I prefer to ride it this way. So I'm going to install the screen in this orientation. So I'll proceed to get the soldering or the melting iron hot and I'll melt out a little spot for this. All right. The melting iron is hot and ready. And I've also clipped the little, uh, feet tabs or foot tabs off of the uh, sides of this display indicator to make the footprint smaller for the hole we're going to have to cut out in the plastic. Now melting plastic is uh, kind of a noxious process so I recommend doing this in a well ventilated area, uh, possibly outdoors if you don't have a large enough space. 
So I'm gonna, uh, the, I'm gonna make sure the iron is actually hot enough. Uh, I'm just gonna start by slowly sort of carving out an area where I want this thing to sit. Now I'm not gonna obviously be able to get through the metal with this, so it's mainly going to be, the goal is mainly going to be just to get a little recessed area of the same dimensions as this screen. So I'm just gonna kind of work my way side to side along here and I'll be able to trim the excess, uh, the excess melted plastic up with a pair of snips later on. So this, uh, this may actually not work as well as I expect it to. I've had good success with forming plastic using a hot iron before, but uh, I've also had bad experiences where it just looks messy and doesn't turn out very well. So this is kind of an experiment in how well this technology will actually work. And uh, mainly just, uh, I was thinking it'd be easier to do it this way than to have to carefully route out the plastic with something else like a Dremel or a router that would have to be the exact dimension size uh, where I'd have to cut the exact size of the, uh, of the footprint I want. So I'll proceed to work on this and I'll update you again if, uh, if it turns out the way I want it to. All right, so I've carved a satisfactory uh, footprint out for this to sit uh, and uh, we'll, where I can glue it in place. And uh, let me tell you, I'm thinking maybe the uh, hot iron was not the most productive way to cut that because it was a pretty slow process. This was a fairly high temperature plastic and uh, it released quite a bit of uh, very smelly fumes. I had to open the door to uh, let some of them out. But I did get the, uh, the size and shape hole that I wanted and you can see I've gotten the plastic. I cut all the way down to the metal and from there I'll be able to feed these conductors uh, in, well, it looks like a bee has taken interest in my board. Anyway, I'll have to put this in, uh, feed the wires through, and uh, glue it down into place. I'm thinking I'm going to use hot melt adhesive uh, just for the ease of uh, construction and the fact that it's a good insulator, and it won't release any acetic acid, uh, which could corrode contacts, unlike uh, low-end silicone sealants, which will release acetic acid. So I'll proceed to glue this in place and uh, kind of pot around it so that it's uh, secure, as secure as possible, and I'll get back to you. So now I've successfully hot glued it in place. Now it doesn't look quite as nice as I would like it to. You can kind of see it's a little rough around the edges, and I made a couple of oopses when I was moving my uh, heating iron around, and I burned the plastic here and there. But a little bit of uh, black nail polish should do wonders to keep this, uh, to keep this the same kind of uh, kind of bright, shiny black uh, housing. And it'll also cover up the hot glue adhesive to make sure that it's uh, a little bit less visible. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to uh, take a little bit of this and first just test it out by repairing these little errors I made here. And it looks pretty good. It, I haven't, uh, I'll have to wait and see when it dries, but I think it's safe to assume that I should be able to proceed throughout the, throughout the rest of this uh, this area to make it the same color as the board. So here we go. Oh yeah, I think that's gonna work perfectly. See now it just kind of blends in with the rest of the hoverboard's uh, chassis. It's the same sort of shiny satiny color as the rest. And it's nice and opaque so you don't see the material underneath. I gotta be careful not to accidentally wipe it on the top of the screen because if I do that, then it'll probably cover up the numbers. So I'll apply a little bit more around this edge. And that should just about do it. Looks much better than it did before, doesn't it? So I'll let that dry now while I proceed to the next section, which is going to be installation of the wiring for this screen. Now that I have the wires penetrating through the board, I have extended them a little bit so that I can make them reach all the way over to the uh, power source. Now I've used 30 gauge wire wrap wire since it doesn't it only has to carry a few milliamps to power that display. And I've secured them in place with some heat shrink and some solder. You can see a more in-depth uh, tutorial on how to use heat shrink on my Electropup restoration video. That's actually, I think, my first video on this channel. So now I'm going to secure these wires in place using some scotch tape, 
just to set them off to the side to make sure that they're not going to uh, get, I guess, smashed in this uh, in the mounting when I re-secure this thing when I put it back together. And uh, mainly just to keep them out of the way of the assembly and the screws and whatnot. Let me see if I can get that in a little bit better. All right, so now I have these two leads that I need to solder into this uh, into this power source board. Actually, looking at it, I may need to find a different solution other than tape. I will fix that before I package this whole thing up. So first I'm gonna deal with the negative connection. So I'm gonna have this trace up and over, and I'm going to secure it to this uh, this through hole that I've circled. Now I'm not gonna strip off too much because I don't want it to stick too far into the hole and I don't know what is under there so I don't want the wire poking around and causing damage. So in fact, I'm actually gonna trim this even shorter. Now next I'm gonna pre-tin that through hole since that is a very small wire to push through. Through hole is pre-tinned. Now I'm going to insert the wire and let the solder harden. So now that's secured to the grounding point. So now I'm gonna do the same thing with the positive supply to the display. Strip a little bit off, trim it a little bit more. Now I'm gonna pre-tin the plus 12 volt hole. Pre-tinned. Now I'm going to insert the wire. All right, wire is inserted. Now to test to see if our solution is going to work properly, the first thing I'm going to do now is, well, move things out of the way, and I'm gonna power it on and see if the voltage display lights up. So here goes. Well, there may be a problem because it's not starting. When I try to short the two pins out to start it, it just makes a click sound. Oh, there it goes. I guess I just wasn't holding it down long enough. Now the moment of truth. And yes, the display is working. We have 0.0, .0 volts showing up. Now if I connect this other wire to something that has voltage, uh, for example, perhaps, well, I'm not sure what uh, is safe to grab onto in here. So maybe I'll come back to that. But it's safe to assume now that this thing is performing as it's intended to. And uh, hopefully once we get the wiring all set up, it will continue to do so. So we'll move on to the next step, which is the installation of the power bond for this and for the inverter or for the uh, output boost con or buck converter supply. So we'll get right to it. I almost forgot one of the most important things that uh, I wanted to do on this underneath here, and that is I want to include a pair of diodes to allow my DROC display to be powered from either the hoverboard's plus 12 volt supply or the plus 13.8 volts I'm going to produce with the buck converter. Now to do that, I'm going to have two blocking diodes, basically just to make sure that voltage or current rather can only flow in this direction and one of these cannot backflow into the other or vice versa. So I'm going to actually desolder the connection that I've already made here and install a small, a pair of small uh, signal level diodes. So I'll get to that and then I will return to show you what I've done once I've finished that operation. It may be somewhat difficult to see in the video, but now I've installed those two diodes that I was talking about. Let me see if I can get it closer to the camera so you can see a bit better. So you see these two small diodes here. One of these diodes connects directly to the uh, input plus 12 volts and supplies it to the display. The other here, I've left the other end disconnected completely so that it can uh, be connected later to the DROC boost convert or buck converter output. So now I'm going to proceed now that I've wired the uh, display to check to make sure it is still functioning the way I want it to. Power is on and the display is still active. Now it's being powered through that diode rather than directly off of the board. And that's going to prevent any problems when I introduce the, uh, the buck converter, which is going to be the second part of this video, wherein I actually construct and install the new converter. So we'll get onto that next. Now, because of the high risk of short circuit during this part of the project, when I cut into the main power line, I'm going to unplug the battery here. So I'm just gonna take this cable connector and uh, 
easily nudge it apart just uh, by pulling it. Now the battery is completely unplugged. So that means anything on this side of the board should be safe to tamper with without worrying about unleashing the fury of 20 18, 18 650 cells onto the rest of this uh, setup. So I'm going to kind of get the wire in place where I want it and I'm going to probably pause the video while I carefully uh, make an incision in the wire and prepare to solder onto it. So now I've stripped away a bit of insulation from the uh, red battery hookup wire, which was uh, terrifyingly easy. The insulation on this is uh, even softer than speaker wire insulation, which is, uh, in my opinion, not ideal for such a high vibration environment. But nevertheless, I've got it ready. Now here you can see I've made a hookup wire where one end is connected to a receiving connector for the upper section where I'm going to place the buck converter. And the lower end is just a piece of copper. So I'm going to try to feed the copper in under the stripped side of the insulation if I can do that. This may require a couple of tries, so I'll go off camera to do it. All right, so now I have the wires uh, wrapped around the insulation here. And I also wrapped the uh, test lead for the signal, uh, for the voltage sensing on that voltage display wrapped around here as well. Now the first thing I'm gonna do before I put any solder in is I'm going to take a flux pen and I'm going to apply a copious amount of flux to the connection. I wanna make certain that it makes good contact and the solder flows properly. Now I'm gonna take my iron and take my solder, and I'm going to use the iron to heat up the surface of the junction. And I'm just gonna start flowing the solder in as it heats. Now this is gonna require a lot of solder, and I need to make sure the penetration is as good as possible. So what you don't wanna see is a big blob like, like it has now. You wanna really see the outline of the conductors like that. So it's a good sign that it's uh, made good contact when you can see that the solder has flowed over the outside of the conductors. And it's always a good idea to give it a solid tug to make sure that nothing's loose or moving around. So now I'm gonna clean the tip of my soldering iron to make sure it stays fresh and doesn't amalgamate with the solder. And I'm going to proceed, uh, proceed to put a significant amount of electrical tape around this, probably more so than it needs, but plenty to make absolutely certain there's no chance of this shorting out to the grounded case and causing the battery to melt down. So I'll proceed to do that. So now I've wrapped the connection with plenty of electrical tape, two separate layers, probably five or six turns each. And that's going to significantly reduce the probability that any arcing to the chassis could occur. It certainly could still happen if it really wears out over time, but this should improve the chances of success of this, uh, of this operation. Now I'm gonna reconnect the battery, like so, and tuck this away so it's out of uh, the way of any damage could, that could come to it. And I'm going to receive, uh, proceed to turn the thing on and see if the, uh, if the display indicator reads around 40 volts. So here we go. Power is on. Now I'm gonna flip the board over. And there it is, 39.3. Our battery voltage is right there. And just to verify the accuracy of the display, I'll get my multimeter out and I'll put it on the 200 volt range. And I'm gonna test between the line here and the, uh, I guess the chassis is not grounded. That's probably a good thing. But I'll also test it against the ground plane here and 39.3 on the mark. That is absolutely perfect. So the screen is dead on, it's connected and uh, we also now have a hookup line for our buck converter, which we're going to insert into here. So next I'm going to, I've already marked out the location of these holes. I'm gonna take that uh, hot melt iron again and I'm gonna lo uh, lower this ring so it's not as prominent. And then I'll drill the holes, mount the converter in and wire it to the switch and input connector, which I'm going to have to drill in as well. So I will get to uh, working on that and I'll show you in a minute. So I saved you some of the boring details of uh, melting plastic and drilling holes, but now I have this uh, lower frame ready for uh, installation of this buck converter. Now in addition, I've also cut and stripped the, uh, uh, the grounded charge lines. I'm going to be installing an additional piece of copper wire here, and I'm going to connect the charging or the uh, board side and that copper lug 
underneath the input side of the buck converter uh, under that screw tab. Now in addition to that I'm going to wire up a wiring harness and later on drill the holes where I'm going to actually attach, well here and here, where I'm going to attach the uh, switch as well as the plug for the 2.1 millimeter barrel connector. So once I've completed those tasks I'm going to proceed to uh, install the buck converter using some thread lock blue to make sure that it doesn't uh, come loose. I'm using number four studs so that they can fit through this uh, this part and in addition to that I am uh, going to then proceed to make sure that it all works. So once I've finished uh, boring out the rest of the holes and tightening this down I'll show you the rest of the wiring. So now I've secured the board in place using some screws or using some bolts rather with nuts and uh, I was originally going to just use uh, thread locker blue to hold this in place but I realized because this is such a high vibration environment and I definitely don't want these nuts falling down into the motherboard and shorting things out I applied a little bit of cyanoacrylate super glue to the end of each nut. So this thing is pretty much going to be stuck in here permanently unless I go in with a pair of uh, a grinder or a pair of bolt cutters and shear these, uh, shear these things off. Which is a possibility in the future, but I don't think I'll need to, at least I hope I don't. So once now that this thing is secured in place, I'm going to proceed to solder uh, this junction wire in uh, to supply the negative rail to this board. And I'm also going to uh, then put some heat shrink over it, shrink it up, and then that way I can still use this for both charging and as my negative supply. So I'll get to doing that and I'll be right back. So now I've connected the negative and heat shrunken it into place. So now this can go back and reconnect to the motherboard and provide the negative rail to this board. Now I'm also going to produce the pos or set up the positive uh, interconnect. So I'm going to take the male end of this uh, contact connector clip and slide it on and take the crimpers, line it up to the right setting, pull the wire back a little and crimp it in place. So now this is going to mate up with that uh, earlier uh, connection receiver that we soldered to the battery terminal before and this part's going to connect into the uh, connection to the buck converter in addition to the negative terminal of this uh, supply line here. So we'll con I'll connect those up and I'll proceed to drill the holes and design the uh, location of the switch and the power on connection next. So in the previous section I forgot to tell you about another part of my uh, system, the, in uh, the inner wiring harness containing the switch as well as a bank of diodes. Now I put these diodes in for two reasons. The first one is uh, it prevents any damage to this should the wiring be hooked up backwards by accident. But secondarily, this boost converter is only rated for a maximum input voltage of 40 volts. Now my battery produces 42 volts and I have tested this and it works okay at 42 volts, but just to be extra safe, these are silicon, uh, these are old fashioned silicon diodes that will actually impose a, roughly a one volt forward voltage drop. So it should make this uh, buck converter or buck converter run a little bit closer to its nameplate uh, rating and it should last longer and be less likely to fail as a result. So now I'm going to proceed to install the wiring harness into the uh, into the system, mount the screw into the hole or the switch into the holes that I have uh, drilled and also mount the barrel connector in the hole that I've drilled for it and wire it to the output stage of this uh, buck converter. All right, so now the upper shell is finished. I've secured the output barrel connector as well as the switch in place, although it looks like the switch is going to protrude a lot further than I thought. So I may actually have to uh, cut this or grind it down with, or cut it with a pair of bolt cutters so it doesn't scrape the ground if the board rolls over. Now I've uh, completely finished wiring this and I have the main connection ready to connect to the battery voltage. I also have a small piece of wire wrap wire which is going to go back to the uh, voltage display screen diode so that we can alternatively power the voltage display screen with this uh, buck converter rather than with the hoverboard's internal battery power. That way you can still read out the voltage even when the hoverboard is shut off. The reason for that is the hoverboard draws a continu uh, continuous load that's quite, uh, quite high when it's running and I would prefer to be able to operate the buck converter and have the uh, voltage display operate without running all the critical systems in the hoverboard. So now I'm going to put all these connectors back together and hopefully everything will fit. Right, so I made a bit of a miscalculation here. 
the diode is on the negative side. I'm not sure why they did it that way, but the diode is on the negative side. And what this means is tapping off the charge port on the negative side was a fruitless endeavor. I may as well have tapped off the positive, but since I've already attached to the battery line, what I'm going to do instead is disconnect my tap and run a secondary line down to the main board using a similar connector in order to derive a negative rail supply for this board. So I'm going to proceed to make those modifications to my existing setup, and hopefully I'll find a good place to tap a negative uh, off of this uh, circuit board. So I think I've solved the problem in kind of an unorthodox way. So I added my original crimp connector back onto the black side of the, uh, of the negative supply to the buck converter, and I had to find a solid source of ground for this one. But that was easier said than done, considering that everything on this board is surface mount apart from the capacitors and a couple of connectors in the diode. So I did something that I didn't even know was possible. I made my own surface mount connection for the wire. What I did was, I, I'll actually move it closer to the camera so you can see better, but I actually scraped the solder mask off of the board in an area that was surrounded by ground plane, and I proceeded to then flux it and then direct solder the conductor to the copper under the solder mask. Now that looks a little sketchy, but it actually hangs in there pretty well. I don't think it's going anywhere. So I'm going to go ahead and stick with that. Hopefully it's not going to melt down or come apart. I am concerned a little bit if this MOSFET gets hot, but you know, if the MOSFET gets hot enough to melt solder, there's other problems going on. So now I should, I'm going to try and set this thing together, and hopefully if all goes well, I'm not going to have any issues with it. So here it goes. So I've got everything connected together, and I just tested it. When I turn the switch on, the light comes on, and the display comes on. So I can assume that uh, my wiring is most likely correct. Now comes the real moment of truth. Can I cram all this junk into this tiny little cavity here without totally ruining everything? So far, so good. It feels pretty loose. Nothing feels like it's getting smashed. I'll go ahead and uh, bolt this thing back together and we'll see if all the features work. So amazingly, everything fit in on the first try. And besides that, the switch actually misses the ground, so it doesn't, uh, isn't going to have a problem rolling over. However, I did notice a couple of problems. For one thing, if I shut this off, it stays powered. And regardless of the position of the switch, it stays powered. Now, it's obviously getting its power from the uh, buck converter, because if I plug in a lead and then measure this using the multimeter, which, wow, my table is getting a bit messy, but if I plug it in with the multimeter and I check here, now bear in mind the switch is in the off position and I line this up, I'm getting my 13.8 volts and it doesn't matter whether the switch is up or down. So either the switch is faulty or there's some kind of weird phantom powering going on where something's backfeeding through the circuit and allowing the buck converter to be powered. So this is going to require me to disassemble this again and figure out what is causing the issue. I'm not sure if it's something backfeeding through the screen or if maybe the switch is just bad or if possibly there's something else going on in the hoverboard that I don't even know about. One issue I did recognize was when I first uh, turned it on, it didn't want to, uh, when, I turned, when I turned the switch on, it threw an error on the computer. The red uh, Hall Effect error light came on. Now I don't know if that's because there's interference from the high frequency switching in the buck converter, or if it's an issue with the phantom power causing voltage drops on the rest of the circuit. Now I am able to ride it in this condition while it's operating. There's no problems there. It just seems to be that for some reason, the converter is exclusively getting power all the time, and I'm not sure why. So I'm going to take it apart again, and I'm going to investigate what the issue is. So after a bit of diagnosis, I have learned, figured out that uh, apparently the most improbable thing is the case. The switch was bad. The switch closed once and then never reopened. Now I don't know if that's to do with over excessive inrush on the capacitors or what, but uh, I verified that it wasn't a problem with backflow through the screen circuit, and it also wasn't a problem with uh, any other sort of voodoo high frequency backfeeding or anything. It was full, getting full voltage straight from the switch. I disconnected the power to the switch. 
uh, from the battery and the whole thing went off. So uh, evidently I'm going to have to change this out. Now this is a, I think this was maybe a used switch. It didn't have any solder on it, but it was one that I pulled out of the electronics box and I guess it's uh, no good. So I'm going to proceed to swap that out and then we'll see if it works a bit better. Okay, so I thought I had fixed the problem, but turns out did the same thing to the other switch. So I did a bit of switch autopsy on the first one, and if you take a look in there, this side here, well the other side actually, has absolutely welded itself closed, and it does not open when you move the lever. And I'm presuming the same thing has happened to this switch as well, because it exhibits the same behavior. So what this means is we have an inrush problem. There is so much current rushing into the capacitors on the boost con or the buck converter when it first starts up that it's welding the switches closed. So I have two options. I could put in an industrial grade switch in the hopes that that would uh, fix the problem, but chances are it'll, I'll, I won't be able to find one in the small form factor and uh, it'll of course stick out and hit the ground if it rolls over. The second option is I need to come up with an inrush limiting solution. So I'm still considering whether I need to use a resistor for that or an NTC thermistor for that, but uh, I'm going to pause the video now, come up with that solution, and then I'll uh, tell you about it once I've solved it. So I think I have identified why the switches keep burning. So on this board are a series or a parallel string of uh, low ESR capacitors. And Additionally, on this board are a parallel string of low ESR capacitors. I believe the problem that we're getting is the low ESR capacitors are being pitted against the other low ESR capacitors across this plenty large enough 18 gauge wire, and we're probably getting a few hundred amps just blasting through that switch every time it closes. So af naturally, after three or four close cycles, it's going to burn itself shut. And in addition, I believe that what's happening is the rest of the board is, uh, the reason it throws an error is because I think it momentarily blips the voltage down below what the CPU can withstand. So my solution, at least my first solution, is I have a pair of 0.47 ohm resistors, 2 watt resistors, that I'm going to be wiring up in parallel and putting in series with the uh, converter. Now, nominally, this will still allow up to 178 amps to flow, which is insane. However, I am suspecting that that uh, it will be much, much less than what is going to be flowing right now. I just think that right now there is such an enormous rush of current between these low ESR capacitors that there's probably potentially as much as 1,000 amps flowing momentarily. Because you have to imagine basically this uh, piece of conductor is being it is the resistor this piece of conductor is dissipating all that and that's a really really low value resistor so i think the problem ultimately is just that the thing is just blowing the switches to bits and i originally was paralleling up dual pull uh dual throw switches to try to get more ampacity but because one is always going to close before the other i think it's just not going to help at all because it's the first one to go is always going to be the one that clamps shut so I may also try it with a single pull, single throw switch just to see if it's less likely to, to because then you have 50% of the original probability of it locking up. So I'm going to proceed to install this new setup and we'll see how it goes. So here's a solution I thought of. I stuck with the dual pull, dual throw switch. Let me get this in focus if I can. Maybe move the camera into the light so it's easier for you to see. But uh, instead of connecting both poles in parallel on the drive side, what I'm going to be doing here is I'm actually going to have these resistors individually connected to each throw. Now what that's going to do is it's going to make it so that on the initial contact only one resistor will be connected in the circuit. And as a result, the inrush will be much will actually be a, a half the current that it would be if both were connected in parallel. However, I needed both resistors because otherwise one would overheat under the load of the four amps that would be placed across it. So I have the t once the switch fully closes and both throws are closed, then the entire, uh, the entire switch is going to be feeding through both of these in parallel. So you get the best of both worlds. It's as if you only have one resistor at inrush, but you have two in parallel when it's under load. So I'll install this and we'll see how it works. All right, so I think I've come up with what is a fairly elegant solution now. Let me show you the comparison between the uh, closing this circuit 
directly without any resistors. That was a big R. Do you see that? That means that just hundreds and hundreds of amps are flowing through there, possibly thousands. But if I make that same connection through the resistors, it's much smaller and more manageable. Now, in addition to this, theoretically, only one of the two resistors will be in contact with the circuit when that side of the switch first closes. So even less, even half of this size arc should occur in the switch. Now, I, st I still think this switch might be a little undersized for that, but I've run it through about 10 or 15 cycles and it hasn't locked up or had any more problems. So hopefully Murphy's Law will not get us when I've closed this thing back up and hopefully this solution will be satisfactory. You'll also notice I've, re I've gotten rid of the diodes since the inrush uh, current through these resistors will certainly drop the voltage more than those diodes would have anyway. So I think hopefully this should solve the problem and even simplify the circuit a bit. All right, so as you can see, I've, I think I've worked all the bugs out of it by now. Now, right now I have it switched off and I'll show you, I can turn the hoverboard on. It's fully functional. I've ridden it around and tested it and the screen is on. So I'll shut the hoverboard off now and I'll show you if I turn the switch on, you get power and I turn the switch off and after a few seconds of discharging the capacitors, the screen goes out. So I've obviously solved the inrush problem. So I made myself this little adapter and I still may upgrade this because the uh, conductors in this 2.1 millimeter barrel jack are really small and they get hot when they're under a lot of load. But for now it works reasonably well. So on one end I have the barrel connector and on the other end I have a car, an automotive accessory plug here. So I'm going to turn the power on and I'm going to connect this to a small Harbor Freight inverter. This is a Centec 80 watt. And the first thing I'll show you is uh, I'll get this 60 watt bulb to light up. And there it goes. 60 watts burning away right there. And this is an incandescent one, so this thing actually draws some serious power. But it doesn't just power light bulbs. If I unplug this, I can also uh, plug in my laptop charger here. This is a 45 watt charger. And when I plug it in, it does have a little bit of a hesitance with the inrush. I suspect that it's because of the uh, cable being fairly short and the inverter being really small. But as you can see, the charge indicator light has come on and is staying on. And right now, the laptop is quite low. It's down to 35%. Let me get that in the screen for you. It's down to 35%, but uh, it is in fact charging, which is a good sign because that's when the uh, charging circuitry in the laptop is going to draw the most power it ever will. Now already this cable has gotten quite hot just from charging the laptop, so it's definitely a sign that I may want to upgrade that in the future. But the actual circuitry in the mod of the hoverboard itself is working. You can see I can turn the hoverboard on and it shouldn't affect the laptop at all. It stays running and keeps charging. And I can't, uh, I don't just have to run inverters on this. Anything that draws less than eight amps that plugs into a, an accessory plug will work. For example, this 100 watt, uh, 10,000 candle power super lamp, this halogen lamp that I have here. And when I power this thing on, there it goes. That's a lot of power. And you can see the battery voltage does sag considerably when I have that thing running. It's down to like 36.5, but it hasn't gone low enough for the hoverboard to shut off and it is still, be, it is still able to power this. Now, uh, I did find out that the battery in this uh, hoverboard was actually not a very good one. It was kind of uh, a replacement that was on par with the quality of the original and I'm, I've already ordered a, an upgraded replacement for it. So you may see me uh, showing some of the characteristics of the upgraded battery in a future video. But for today, this battery is good enough and it does work reasonably well. So I thought as a test, I might take it out and uh, run this million or this 10,000 candle light, uh, candle power flashlight outside for you and show you how this uh, upgraded connection can work quite nicely. So I'll be back in a minute. All right, so I'm outside on the hoverboard, as you can see here and I've got my 10,000 candle power halogen lamp hooked up to it. Now I'm gonna power this lamp on, so I'm gonna switch the position of the camera, and now I'm going to proceed to power on the powered lamp. Here goes. And there it is, 10,000 candle power driven off nothing but my hoverboard. This is one of the coolest modifications I've done so far. And I think it turned out really nicely, especially considering uh, how many obstacles there were. I wasn't sure anything was going to fit in the container or if anything was going to work the way I expected it to, but 
it really did turn out tremendously well. So now that I've come in from writing outside, I decided to hook a larger inverter up to do a bit of a performance test. So I've got a 400 watt Sentec inverter connected, and I have one of my 1000 watt Rockville PA speakers connected to that. So I'm going to plug it in and let's see what happens. like this thing doesn't have any trouble providing the amperage required to drive a large speaker like that. Anyway, I'd say this is a success. So there you have it. This may be the world's first combination hoverboard slash power bank uh, power supply. Now I've find the last thing I've done is I've marked it as 13.8 volts with a maximum output of 8 amps. Now some of you may, may be wondering why did I choose 13.8 volts? Why not uh, 12 volts or something else? Well, I chose 13.8 volts because that happens to be the float charging voltage for a lead acid battery. In other words, this output could be directly connected to a dead car battery and used to trickle charge that car battery up to a level to which it could be used to start a car. Now, obviously, it won't deliver enough power on its own to actually crank the engine, but it can gradually deliver enough uh, power into the dead battery in a car to fully charge it or, or charge it to the point where it could start a car. So that's also a useful feature uh, in addition to all the other things you could plug in like USB adapters and whatnot. So I think this is a fairly good versatile modification. In addition, the voltage display screen is quite useful even without the buck converter. So if you were interested in just installing this display, that would also be a viable option so you could keep better track of how much distance you have on the hoverboard. Uh, if for reference, in case you were wondering, 42 volts would be a maximum state of charge and about 31 volts to 30 volts is about the minimum uh, you'd want to run it down. Any lower than that, you'll risk damaging the cells in the battery pack. But discussion of the maximum and minimum voltages of lithium ion batteries is a topic for another video. So I'd like to end by saying, if you do attempt this, as I said at the beginning of the video, it is at your own risk. I don't recommend modifying or, uh, or using the equipment in such a way that the manufacturer did not specify like this type of modification and if you do so once again you are doing so at your own risk so thank you for watching dielectric videos i hope you, i hope you enjoyed this and hope you learned something today see you later